This episode is sponsored by Card Kingdom. Ferry on over to cardkingdom.com slash studies to pick up your favorite spooky swamps and haunted plains for your Athreos decks. I use these ones in my own build. This episode is sponsored by Coalesce Apparel and Design. Navigate your skiff to Coalesce to purchase some magic-inspired clothing, stickers, and playmats. Use code STUDIES at checkout for 10% off your haul. Caron demonio, con occhi di bragia, loro accennando tutte le raccoglie, batte col remo qualunque sadagio. By the time we arrive at Inferno in 1320, the myth of the ferryman who caters souls across the rivers Acheron and Styx will already be familiar to most of Western Europe. Centuries before Dante and the proliferation of the Catholic Church, Virgil wrote Sharon into the Aeneid, describing him as appalling, filthy, donned in a knotted cloak with an unkempt white beard and eyes like jets of fire. Charon was also a popular subject in illustrations on Greek pottery. Athenian red figure vases from centuries prior show drawings of a poor man rowing. Unlike in Virgil's text, his features here are rather unremarkable. In contrast to the Greeks, the Etruscans of central Italy envision Charon not as a man, but as a demon with snake-like hair, pointed ears, and enormous wings. His appearance in their imagination was far more sinister. In the Divine Comedy, Dante defers to the Charon of Virgil's poem, his literary guide. He describes the psychopomp, or escort of the dead, as an aged man, his hair white with years, yelling at the corrupted souls in his circle. In Inferno, the boatman is not a neutral party in the spirit's journey to the afterlife. Rather, he plays an active role in perpetuating their suffering. Sharon's anger is alive in Gustave Doré's wood engravings from 1861. As the sinner's exaggerated bodies hopelessly repent, Sharon swings his oar like an executioner's axe to herd the mass of human cattle. Another engraving from this canto offers a dynamic portrait of the ferryman. His muscular body carves into the rough waters, the shape of which resembles the figure work of the Renaissance. His haunting eyes glow white beneath a pair of furrowed brows blanketed in dark black. Athreos' God of Passage offers a new interpretation of a millennia-old myth. Rather than a decrepit, bitter man or a tusked devil with blue skin, the caterer to Theros' underworld is a behemoth of a creature. Like all of the 15 original gods, Athreos is of tremendous size. His body towers over the misty waters gently swaying beneath him. A crumbling statue in the foreground gives the viewer a sense of Athreos's colossal scale as his ethereal body weaves between the smoky clouds of the night sky above. He is ghost-like. His torso disappears atop the tide as he floats along the river, which lends an immaterial weightlessness to his figure. The Theros gods are liminal beings. They oscillate between creatures and enchantments on the battlefields, and their illustrations mirror the in-between state in which they exist. Mechanically, Athreos fulfills his role as a shepherd of the dead. When creatures die, opponents must pay life to send them to the graveyard. If the debt is not paid, then the creature is denied passage and returns to life again. In practice, this haggling becomes the crux of gameplay loops one that pilots seek to leverage to tremendous advantage. Playing against Athreos often traps you in a revolving door of catch-22 decision trees. You are damned if you pay the ferryman, and damned if you don't. I've played Athreos in EDH for a long time, and shuffling him up in a game of Commander invites me to deal abstractly with death. Aristocrat decks of this nature often assemble a group of innocuous 1 and 2 drops, send them through a sacrifice outlet, then revel in the triggers as they pile onto the stack. It's sort of a perverse catharsis. Only in a game environment would mass death be cause for celebration. And rarely is dying an isolated instance when Athreos is lingering about. Instead, it becomes the primary event that one initiates over and over. 
In this way, navigating a deck like Athreos emulates the cycle of a roguelike in a magic environment. I played a lot of Hades in the winter of 2021. Much like my Athreos deck, Hades asks its players to confront death over and over again as Zagreus repeatedly defies the gods in his escape from the underworld. In every attempt to get out, I encountered the familiar face of a boatman who offers items and enhancements for the long journey in exchange for coin. Supergiant Sharon is a beast of few words, but his assistance is invaluable in the effort to reverse the catabasis. His character design is synonymous with the Etruscan paintings. A face of rotting flesh hides beneath a fisherman's hat as he stands supported by an oar decorated with waves. His body is draped in a heavy cloak accented by gold sleeves and a bulky necklace of obols chained together. He is stoic and resolute. For him, death is a matter of business and negotiation, and he wears it as such. A couple of years before the release of Hades, magic returned to Theros, and with it came the reimagining of its pantheon of gods. In this set appeared Athreo Shroudveiled, and with it a masterpiece illustration by Igor Kirluk. A thematic rhyme to Ryan Barger's original piece, this painting leans further into Athreos's haunting presence in the domain of the dead. His fingers are long and curled, his staff gnarled and worn, his veil an eerie mask over a mysterious hidden face. Pale skin marked with veins and scars glows against a gray wall of storm clouds. A drowned pillar helps establish scale once more, as do a pair of chains which serve to place this scene in the underworld. This depiction of Athreos is moody, unsettling, and apprehensive. Like Dante Sharon, the ferryman here is not one to befriend. With Athreos's second printing arrived a new mechanical minigame. No longer would opponents be forced to pay the ferryman. Instead, players distribute coin counters onto their creatures, which grant them a second chance at life when they die. This is a lovely detail that has traces to ancient literary and archaeological history. In the article Sharon's Obel and Other Coins in Ancient Funerary Practice, author Susan T. Stevens details the significance of a low-denomination coin to Greek funeral rites. References to Sharon's fee span over 700 years in Greek and Latin literature, suggesting that placing a coin in the mouth of the recently deceased was a legitimate practice and not simply a metaphor in a story. In the ancient imagination, the soul was carried in the head, thus inserting the coin into the mouth connected the currency to the transcending spirit. It was believed that those without coin would be denied passage by Sharon, and this idea is at play on Athreos's new card. Stevens traces this practice beyond the old world, and notes that coins still carry symbolic value in military burials in the present era. The myth of Sharon's fee persists. When played together in concert, both versions of Athreos harmonize and grant a conditional immortality to the rest of your board. I appreciate that their illustrations show the ferryman moving in opposite directions. The flattened, two-dimensional compositions emphasize the endless back-and-forth journey that Athreos must make as part of his duty. The tone of these paintings is also reflective of his subdued character. Reading flavor text across the Theros sets provides insight into the god's demeanor. Unlike Sharon of Dante's poem, Athreos seems to care, at least in part, that the dead receive safe passage to the other side. In coming to terms with my own death, I find myself hoping for a similar treatment. It might be nice to have a guide patiently waiting to show me the way. This is central to understanding why Sharon's image persists in the collective imagination. The figure of the boatman who guides the dead is not unique to the ancient Greeks. Derivatives of the same story appeared in Ireland, Egypt, the Philippines, and Mesopotamia. The role of the psychopomp is to provide comfort to the living, to assure them that their loved ones who pass will not be lost in the realm beyond. Of course, the horrific renditions of Sharon invert that sense of security and emphasize the terror of dying. Michelangelo's render in the Sistine Chapel, for example, aligns closely with the Etruscan vision of Hell's ferryman. Francis A. Sullivan comments that the terrible figure of Sharon, 
originally a creation of folklore, now became a striking artistic symbol of the agony of human beings when confronted by the awful mystery of death. The menacing creature here, like that of Dante and Doré, is a warning and a threat to the living. It is no coincidence that only the sinners must face such a demon on their way to the afterlife. But Sharon in Hades and Athreos in Magic provide a soothing sense of calm against life's greatest mystery. Their presence is tranquil, like that of the ferryman in this painting by Arnold Bachlin called Isle of the Dead from 1880. This version is the first of five reproductions. The original composition featured an oarman approaching a small rocky island fit with cypress trees and a few tombs. This painting enraptured Bachlin's friend Marie Berna, who requested that he add the white figure and covered coffin we see in all five copies. Bachlin describes the piece as a dream image that produced such a stillness that one would be awed by a knock on the door. The painting captured the admiration of so many throughout the 20th century. Its popularity was underlined by the anecdote by Vladimir Nabokov, who stated that reproductions of the painting could be found in every Berlin home. Admirers ranged from Sigmund Freud to Vladimir Lenin and Adolf Hitler, as well as Salvador Dali and H.R. Giger, who both paid homage to the painting with their own interpretations. Isle of the Dead wrestles with the same very human fear embodied in the figure of Sharon. This painting, though, is a quiet refuge from that fear. It suggests that the passage to the other side will be easy and effortless. Like a dream, it won't make much sense, but also like a dream, its logic won't be questioned. Bachlin provides a profound sense of reassurance in this painting. I find it medicinal and therapeutic. Perhaps it's the very gentle waters surrounding the boatman, or the pastoral features of the stony island, or the mellow light against the rocks that hints at a distant sunset. This image invites its viewers to imagine their own voyage into the unknown, but pacifies any worries that such a thought may stir up. The character of Athreos invokes a similar line of thought. When magic pulls from myth as its source material, it allows us to connect with the same stories told by civilizations that have come and gone. The afterlives of these tales stretch across time and take new shapes to speak to their new audiences. Playing Athreos connects me to a long lineage of stories about a ferryman who must guide the dead across treacherous waters. Of course, magic is just a game, and poems are just poems, and paintings are just paintings. But for those who are listening, the power of stories is far greater than the medium in which they reside. And sometimes those stories help us come to terms with what happens after, and what a thought that is. <laughs>